let's talk about stress concentration factors. Stress concentration factors are these factors that are usually tabulated in graphs. They're ways for us to design complex geometries where usually our calculations of stress are based on these ideal simplistic geometries. And when we have these geometric inconsistencies, uh, it's hard to uh, account for that unless we've already solved the problem of how high the stresses get as a result of that geometric change. So to talk about stress concentration factors, let's start by talking about a very simple state of stress. Let's say we've got a round pin. So we're looking at the pin from the side here, diameter one inch, and we're going to put a 500 pound axial load on it. Now, uh, we know from experience that the stress in this pin theoretically is the same everywhere. It's a uniaxial tensile stress. And so there's really no stress gradient. There's no change in strain. The strain is the same everywhere in this part and it's the stress is simply described by p over a uh, which comes out to be 4p over pi d squared in this case very simple problem if we put 500 pounds on this one inch diameter pin we get 637 psi of stress but the question becomes what if we had a geometric change like this added shaft section over here of a, a higher diameter. So we would expect the, the stress here and therefore the strain would be lower and the stress here would be what we just calculated, this 637 PSI and the strain that's associated with that depending on what material we use. Now this radius here defines how sharply the strain needs to kind of navigate around that corner and as a result we have to account for that. It's not just the low stress here and the higher stress here and that's that and we just calculate the smallest stress because of this geometric inconsistency around this corner there's actually going to be a higher state of stress than is what we would call nominal in either section of the shaft otherwise for example here's a 2d finite element simulation of what's going on here over here we see kind of a color map so blue green is lower than the kind of yellow red so if you think about kind of a color map that it goes from blue up to red uh, this is indicating a low level of stress over here which we see over here this is indicating our nominal level of stress here but we see that the red indicates this maximum right around that corner and it has to do with the ability of the material to carry that strain around that corner and the way that the the strain reacts because we have a material continuum because we can't pull the material apart because it's not splitting these things are connected together they stretch in a way essentially around that corner and react to that change in geometry notably you notice down here this isn't really carrying much stress at all in fact it's carrying very very low stress around this what we would call the shoulder uh, so often, if I'm trying to optimize the amount of material, you'll see big chamfers here because the material here isn't really doing anything. In fact, if I remove some of this material, it can actually start to alleviate that a little bit because it reduce my effective D over D ratio. In any case, what we see is this elevated stress that is higher than either of the shaft sections in what we would call nominal sense, just that simple P over A would indicate. So our nominal stress is going to generally by convention be based on whatever the smallest cross section present is. So if I have a hole through a plate, I'm going to consider the part of the plate usually missing the hole. So I'm, I'm going to make my nominal stress that in this case, it's this smaller shaft section off to the right. And so our nominal stress here is the 637 PSI we calculated before, but the maximum stress at this corner, we're going to call sigma max and that's based on a kt value that's been tabulated based on this geometry and so we can look up that kt value and say the presence of this particular type of notch in this geometry with this type of load is going to increase that nominal stress by a factor kt hence the term stress concentration factor and these are often tabulated for different geometries and generally what we're going to do as designers is try to find a geometry that's very similar to what we're designing and use a kt value that we can quickly look up Usually this is a function of how sharp this fillet is in relation to the size of the part. So what we would call the R over D ratio here. And then also the D over D ratio, how abrupt is the change in geometry from this part to this part. Different, um, different geometries are going to have different things that this stress concentration factor is a function of. You're just going to have to kind of A, use your head and B, if you need to look up background information on where this comes from. If you need good background information on where the stress concentration, stress concentration factors come from, 
Peterson's Stress Concentration Factors, which is literally just a book of these factors and their derivations, where they come from, explanations that are limitations, etc. That's a good resource. If you're looking in the back of just Shigley and Norton, it doesn't give much discussion on where those models come from. So you get a lot better background with a book like, like Peterson's Stress Concentration Factors. So let's take an example here. Uh, let's say that we uh, have a radius, and I know that I want a one inch diameter here and one and a half inch diameter here. I'm gonna put it under 500 pound load. And I wanna understand what sigma max, what happens to sigma max as I look at different radii. So if I start with a quarter inch radius, which is a radius that just starts here at 90 degrees and ends here at 90 degrees. It's the biggest fillet that I can put in there and have it tangent to both surfaces here, the shoulder and the outside of the shaft here. So that's a big radius, a quarter inch radius. That gives me a KT value of 1.5. I have an R over D ratio of 0.25. And if this is the curve for my D over D ratio of 1.5, which it is, then I can read off the KT value here. The nice thing about this, and often you'll look in a book and it'll have the graph and then it'll have a bunch of functions. The idea here is that if I'm doing a quick design iteration, I wanna just look at the graph and read the value. It takes just a few seconds to do that. If you really need that specific number, you know, these are probably good to two, maybe three significant figures, then it might be worth actually typing that into your calculator, et cetera. But outside of that, usually I'm gonna read the graph. In any case, for a quarter inch radius, we get a KT of 1.5, which indicates a sigma max of 956 PSI. We didn't change the geometry here except for the radius. And so where I have 637 PSI, now I have a maximum stress of 956. It's in a, significant increase even with a really generous radius. Generally what's going to happen is as I make that corner sharper it's more difficult for that strain to kind of navigate or negotiate around that corner as a continuum and therefore we get a higher and higher stress concentration. For example if I move down to an eighth of an inch so I half that radius now I get a KT of 1.75 okay and I can again just read that right off the graph. And that gives me a max stress of 1115 PSI. If I sharpen down to a 16th inch radius, now we're getting to the point where we're near a tooltip radius for a, a lathe tool. Now I see a KT of 2.2 and a maximum stress of 1400 PSI, where I normally would have calculated a maximum, ignoring that stress concentration factor, of only 637 PSI. This is this is significant. Let's say that I ignored this stress concentration factor and had used a factor of safety of two, two and a half. I'm almost in yielding at that corner. Uh, so we have to be very careful about acknowledging these changes in geometry and making sure that we try to model them accurately. Let's do a design example uh, and, and let's really think about how this works. One thing to, to think about here, let's say I, I design this part out of some 6061T6 aluminum. It's got a yield strength of 40,500 PSI. And we could say, well, okay, I know KT axial, let's say I set the radius to 16th of an inch. I can calculate the load that would cause localized yielding around this corner. And a reminder of what ductile materials do here. Remember that in this section, my stress is very low. My stress here under that 500 pound load is on the order of like 250, 300 pound, uh, sorry, PSI. And in this section, it's still 637 PSI. That has not changed. But we know that the uh, the stress around this corner is, is much higher. So let's figure out what load could I put on this that would cause yielding around this corner. Remember that in this section at that load, I'm not going to be anywhere near yielding. I'm still going to have factor of safety against yielding of about 2.2 when yielding starts to happen here. I've got an even higher factor of safety against yielding in this section when this part starts to yield here. And suddenly we realize that I might have different factors of safety against yielding at different critical points in my design. And I might need to think about that. A given part, I might need to analyze more than one point as a critical failure mode, if a critical point. So we can do a back calculation and say, okay, with this geometry, with a 16th inch radius, 14,500 pounds is going to cause yielding at that corner. Okay. So what happens is I get yielding here and that yielding, as long as my material is ductile, is going to relax that stress concentration and it's going to harden the material and strengthen that material. Assuming that happens and I've got enough ductility to withstand that, in other words, my elongation before failure becomes really important here, 
what we might see is if I start to increase the load from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000 to 8,000, as I increase this load past 14,500 pounds, this area is going to yield and I won't see the stress increase. That stress is going to basically top off and as long as I've got sufficient ductility to continue to deform, then what I'm going to see is that material stress relax until I have enough load to cause yielding wholesale in this part here. And then once that happens, now the whole part starts to yield and I really start to encounter problems. So to show this as an example, let's look at the maximum stress versus an applied load. And what I did was I took a pretty accurate finite element model of this geometry and I used a plastic deformation simulation that uh, has the ability to reflect the effects of strain hardening in plasticity. So beyond the yield point. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to plot out the points. As I applied a load in the program, I started with zero load and I ramped that load up to 30,000 pounds. And you would expect from a linear elastic perspective that that stress would just continue to increase. But the reality is that when the maximum stress encountered hits the yield point, it can't go any higher. It limits that stress and can actually protect these parts of the part kind of artificially as the, the strain around that stress concentration factor kind of gives. As a result, this, this type of thing is what led to the de Havilland Comet disaster that we've discussed in class and you can look that up online. There's some interesting details about that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to apply a load and start at zero pounds and go to 30,000 pounds. And what we should see at 14,500 pounds or so is it's going to level off and that, that maximum stress is going to be limited to 14,500 as we change that geometry and relax that stress concentration factor. So we see the load increasing here and bumps about 14,000, 15,000 pounds, it levels off and we see basically no increase in stress and we could continue until we got to the point that we got yielding actually in this section of the part. And then you would see it either break or, or go from there. So what happens if I have a combined load? So let's say we've still got our design here. We've got a radius of 16th of an inch. We know that the KT value associated with that is 2.2. Different types of loads will have different stress concentration factors. And the way that we normally would account for that is we're going to make one basic assumption. We are going to, well, sorry, two basic assumptions. The first assumption that we're going to usually make is that these act independently and orthogonally. In other words, the KT value for my axial load is not affected by and doesn't really talk to a KT value from a bending load or a torsional load. So they act kind of independently. And we're going to also assume that they act simultaneously on the same exact element, which is also not exactly the case, but it's a decently conservative estimate. It's an assumption and it's not a terrible assumption and you're generally in the same vicinity. So let's say that we've got this P equals 500 pounds. Let's also add a 500 inch pound bending moment. And then we look up our KT value for this same geometry and bending, it's 1.9. It's not 2.2. They're different because their stress distributions are different. And therefore the way those stresses and strains interact with this geometry change are also different. Let's also add a torsion of a thousand inch pounds. And I look up KTS, which is usually the, how we denote that it's a shear uh, stress concentration factor. And we see a 1.7, uh, so lower than the bending and the axial. Again, it's a different stress distribution, so it interacts differently. So the way that we would normally approach this is to say sigma xx, assuming x is our longitudinal axis of our part here, is going to be combined, the bending stress and the axial stress, and it's going to be up here and down here. So at the top and bottom where we experience both of our maximum bending stresses and our axial stress, which is present throughout the cross section. So sigma xx is going to be kt axial times p over a, our nominal stress there, plus kt bending times mc over i. So each part of that stress equation is increased by its respective KT value. And so we have 2.2 times 4P over pi D squared plus 1.9 times 32M over pi D cubed. Similarly, uh, our shear stress is increased by our KTS value. So we have TC over J times our 1.7 here. And we can construct our stress tensor and 
here is our maximum stress tensor, again, making those assumptions that that stress, all of these maximum stresses act on the same element at the same time and that they're not affected by each other. So we're inside the linear elastic region. Yielding isn't happening because once that happens, these models kind of break down. And so we can find an effective stress, a von Mises effective stress of 18,644 PSI. And we have a factor of safety against yielding in this case with these loads on this part, if it was made of 6061 of 2.2. If we had ignored this geometric change and just said, okay, um, what, what would the actual stress have been if we had just designed it for this, it would be much lower. Uh, similarly, we can look at the factor of safety against yielding in this section here in our nominal stress. And we look at our nominal stress without the KT values, we find a nominal effective stress of only 10,517 PSI. So where we would have thought that this is as high as the stress was and so thought, oh yeah, I've got a three or four factor of safety by simply ignoring this and say, okay, I'm gonna model this very simply. I need to slap that big factor of safety on there. You know, even then a uh, factor of safety of 3.9 only indicates an actual factor of safety here if I actually account for that geometric change of 2.2. So we do need to consider this wherever we can. We need to look at this and get good numbers because sometimes, depending on the geometry you're dealing with, you may find really, really big uh, KT values, depending on what you're doing, snap ring grooves, holes and shafts, that type of thing. You can actually wind up with extremely high KT values, enough that that typical factor of safety may not save you. So you have to be very careful to acknowledge these geometric differences because in your designs, the reality is that, that you're going to need to make these changes in your designs and you're going to need to pay attention to these things. So in general, the, the general mantra is going to be that for a combined set of loads, we're going to consider each load with its own KT value, then combine those loads into stresses, assuming that those stresses all act on the same element and then calculate your effective stress from there. And so this is the basic way that we uh, use stress concentration factors in design. And this is kind of a first shot. It's a quick way to get good models. And then from there, we kind of see a little bit better what's going on in the material and we can get a, a pretty good guess. Depending on which kind of set of tables that you're looking at or what kind of geometries you're looking at, usually these values are, are quite good. And this is why it's important to read the background. Usually for something like a step shaft, if I'm designing a step shaft that looks just like what I'm pulling out of the table, that's, you know, low factor safety information. That's kind of factor safety of 1.5 to 2, assuming that it's a good model. Some other things we have no solution for, and it's like, hey, this, this was developed out of a finite element simulation or photoelasticity. And then it's kind of more of a guess. A guess it's kind of 2, 2.5, maybe north of there. So you gotta, you've got to reason with the numbers in front of you, but do understand that this method and approaching things from this approach is way faster than doing a properly done finite element solution. And any finite element solution should start with this because it's very easy, as we've seen in class, to get results out of a finite element solution that look right but are wrong. So... This is a really basic tool, but it can be very powerful. And in the hands of somebody who knows where to look for what tables and how to apply those tables, uh, you can be a pretty effective designer and do a good job of that quick iteration that is the hallmark of somebody who's good with design.